Smoky Mountain Wrestling was a professional wrestling promotion that held events in the Appalachian area of the United States from October 1991 to December 1995 when it was run by Jim Cornette. The promotion was based in Knoxville, Tennessee with offices in Morristown. Episodes are available on the WWE Network. It was 1991. As a taxi driver by the name of Rodney King became internationally known after a tape was released of him being beaten on March 3rd by the Los Angeles police, the release of Nirvana's Nevermind signified the start of the grunge era that would dominate the music scene up into the mid-1990s. The Pittsburgh Penguins beat the Minnesota North Stars in Game 6 of the Stanley Cup Finals, and Jim Cornette formed Smoky Mountain Wrestling in October 1991 upon leaving World Championship Wrestling with Stan Lane, Tim Horner, and Sandy Scott. The promotion was backed financially by music producer Rick Rubin. The first events and TV tapings were held in October and November 1991. Matches from these shows were first shown in February 1992. The first Smoky Mountain Heavyweight Champion, Primetime Brian Lee, won the championship in a tournament held at a Volunteer Slam on May 22, 1992 in Knoxville, Tennessee. The first Smoky Mountain Tag Team Champions were crowned in a tournament final on April 23, 1992 in Harrogate, Tennessee when the Heavenly Bodies defeated the Fantastics. Jim Cornette had initially envisioned a territory reaching from Kentucky into as far as South Carolina and Georgia, though they did eventually run events over that large of a region, including a few shows in the Cobb County Civic Center in Marietta, Georgia. The promotion's biggest towns included Knoxville and Johnson City, Tennessee. SMW event tours also included high school gyms and fairs in cities throughout Tennessee, Kentucky, West Virginia, Virginia, and North Carolina. In 1993, Smoky Mountain Wrestling signed deals with World Championship Wrestling and the World Wrestling Federation to showcase their wrestlers on the larger company shows. This led to the Rock and Roll Express wrestling the Heavenly Bodies at Super Bowl 3 in February and the Heavenly Bodies then face the Steiner Brothers for the WWF Tag Team Championship at SummerSlam 1993 and then defeating the Rock and Roll Express at Survivor Series 1993 for the SMW Tag Team Championship. The promotion featured a number of wrestlers who were regulars in the southeastern wrestling scene and was the birthplace of the Heavenly Bodies, Stan Lane and Tom Pritchard, and later Tom Pritchard and Jimmy Del Rey. The Heavenly Bodies, managed by Jim Cornette, were featured heavily throughout the years as they worked storyline feuds with the Rock and Roll Express, the Fantastics and the Armstrong family. SMW also featured a number of young wrestlers who had not yet made their mark on the national stage, including Bob Holly, New Jack, Al Snow, Glenn Jacobs, Balls Mahoney, Chris Jericho, Lance Storm, Chris Candido, Tammy Lynn Sitch, Brian James, and D'Lo Brown. But ultimately, like most independents, was not financially successful. Cornette eventually signed a working agreement with the World Wrestling Federation to trade talent, manage, and serve as an on-air talent for the company. Brian Hildebrand was a Smoky Mountain mainstay, occupying such roles as head of merchandise, referee, and sound director. Jim Cornette, a traditionalist, catered to fans that Mick Foley described as old-time fans who still believed in good guys and bad guys, and to whom cheating was still reason to get upset. Bob Cottle, who was a play-by-play -play announcer on the TV program, would also proclaim at the beginning of each show that Smoky Mountain Wrestling was professional wrestling the way it used to be and the way you like it. This was a sharp contrast to ECW 
in which anti-heroes increasingly took precedence over clear-cut heroes and villains. Smoky Mountain was, however, the birthplace of the controversial gangsters gimmick where black wrestlers New Jack and Mustafa would cut promos about activist Medgar Evers while also using fried chicken and watermelon as props. The promotion had a brief association with the National Wrestling Alliance whose flagship promotion, Eastern Championship Wrestling, had split away in August 1994, leaving the NWA with no World Heavyweight Champion. A 10-man tournament was held in Cherry Hill, New Jersey in November featuring many SMW wrestlers. Their participants were Tracy Smothers, Devin Storm, Eddie Gilbert, Johnny Gunn, Chris Candido, Al Snow, Dirty White Boy, Jerry Lawler, Lou Perez, and Osamu Nishimura. The winner was Chris Candido, who defended his title mostly at SMW events. In February 1995, however, Candido lost the belt to Ultimate Fighting Championship winner Dan Severn, who, as a freelancer, decided to become a traveling world champion, depriving SMW of a basis for World Heavyweight Championship matches. However, in April 1995, the Rock and Roll Express won the NWA World Tag Team Championship for the fifth time, giving SMW a handful of World Tag Team Championship matches. Al Snow debuted at the beginning of 1995 at SMW. A tragic event then partnered him up with the giant Unabomb. When his original partner, Eddie Gilbert, with whom he had just launched a feud against the Rock and Roll Express, had died of a drug overdose. Snow took Gilbert's place. The roles of the team were clear. Snow was the mouth, Unabom the muscle. Their first attempt at Morton and Gibson was Sunday Bloody Sunday 2. Snow and Unabom still failed against the Rock and Roll Express, but Snow's big mouth made sure that the Express was so irritated that they could not stay with the match. In his funny as well as vicious promos and parodies of the Express, Snow was nothing sacred. He mocked Morton as a secret transvestite and even made fun of Gibson's deaf and dumb mother by being upset that she left him a note in braille. Snow got Morton a joke for his jokes by knocking him down with a miner's glove, causing the team's next match at Bluegrass Brawl 3 to be scheduled as a coal miner's glove on a pole match. Snow was beaten by Morton with the glove KO but fell in pin position on the previously knocked out Gibson. The heel duo won and crowned themselves the league's new tag team champions. However, Snow did not have enough. The following week, he made formal funeral arrangements for Morton's career in the style of a sleazy television preacher. Symbolically, he threw Morton's headband in a wooden coffin. Morton's career was far from dead. As punishment, Snow had been put in a scaffold match with Morton, a match that can only be won by knocking his opponent off a several meter high platform. Snow was ready to finally break Morton's neck in the match, but in the end it was Morton who got his revenge for the many humiliations and pushed Snow down. But that was not over, because Snow was a bad loser and attacked Morton after the match, ensured that fans' hatred for Snow and Unabom remained undiminished. Ultimately, however, it should be noted it was not the Express that dethroned the pair as champions, but the thugs, Tony Anthony and Tracy Smothers. Off the title screen, however, the feud between Snow and Unabomb and the Express went even further. There was a series of gimmick matches, steel cage matches, and street fights, all of which went to the Rock and Roll Express. In the fall of 1994, Legendary horseman Ole Anderson was featured in the weekly TV show as Smoky Mountain Wrestling with an announcement in Family Matters. Ole said that his son Bryant had signed up with SMW and would debut there soon. The young Bryant was already known by this time from WCW where he was fired by Eric Bischoff. At SMW, Bryant now had bigger plans. Bryant debuted in October with his dad by his side with the same look that he had in the 70s. Bryant quickly made his first sense of achievement as he won the television title against Scott Studd, who later became Scotty Riggs. 
The defense of the belt presented Bryant bigger challenges because two weeks later he would face the former SMW heavyweight champion Tracy Smothers. But Bryant managed to surprise and defend the belt clearly and fairly against his experienced challenger. Smothers wanted to pay him respect with a handshake, but Bryant did not. It turned out that Bryant and Smothers had a history. The two had already met when Bryant was a college wrestler at the University of Tennessee. Smothers stopped by every now and then to help with the training, and Bryant accused Smothers of having tackled him hard. Bryant wanted payback in SMW. As a result, there were a number of other matches of the two in the series like Thanksgiving Thunder, and a young Anderson won them over. Bryant wanted to demonstrate even more clearly that he had outgrown Smothers. He therefore called him to a submission exhibition in which the two would compete for who would force an opponent to tap faster. After Anderson had forced James Atkins to the tap, Smothers tried the same with the figure four leg lock against Anthony Michaels. But when he got Michaels under control, Anderson attacked him, injuring his shoulder. That was a setup for a series of I Quit matches of the two brawlers at Christmas Chaos. Smothers managed to beat the young freshman and put him in his place. It was a culmination of the feud, which continued on house shows until January 1995, but no longer developed decisively. Shortly thereafter, Brian Anderson left SMW and wrestling as a whole. Although he proved his talent in the matches against Smothers, he simply quit the business. Whether it was Kentucky, Tennessee, Virginia, or North Carolina, none of the U.S. states where Smoky Mountain Wrestling operated was a stronghold of gangster culture. When you say iced tea, most of the SMW audience was thinking of a soft drink. Ice Cube was something you put in it, and NWA was nothing else than the National Wrestling Alliance. For that reason, this was a brilliant idea. Jim Cornette took the risk in 1994 with the creation of the Gangstas, New Jack and Mustafa Saeed. With the Gangstas, Cornette made a bomb that contained a highly explosive mixture of almost all elements of the race question. The Gangstas brought together bits and pieces of ghetto culture, the Nation of Islam, and a perverted interpretation of the Civil Rights Movement. The best way to illustrate this was to demand they win their matches after a two count, rather than a three count as a form of affirmative action. And the detonator of this bomb was New Jack's rhetorical rambles and his ability to turn his listeners into a furious mob in just a few words, especially those in the southern states with their well-known racial tension. New Jack and Mustafa debuted in July 1994 and needed a promo from New Jack to become one of the most hated men in the league. New Jack began with references to O.J. Simpson, Luis Farrakhan, and Snoop Doggy Dogg. In response to the gangsters, several broadcasters from the SMW syndication switched off and eventually the civil rights movement, the NAACP, demonstrated against SMW because it saw no positivity in the gimmick. The Gangstas then announced on Night of Legends they were aiming for the Rock and Roll Express. They cost Ricky Morton and Robert Gibson their match against Brian Lee and Chris Candido, and thus the titles. The Express then regained the belt on the next TV taping, and the way for the altercation with the Gangstas was free. It was followed by a series of matches between the two teams, which quickly degenerated into beating across the arenas into the parking lots. At a match in Johnson City, Morton crashed New Jack's head so hard into a Corvette that it triggered the alarm. Jim Cornette brought ex-WWE enhancement talent Johnny Canine, who was repackaged as Bruiser Bedlam in 1994, as an enforcer in his perpetual feud against Bob Armstrong and his sons. Bedlam, who put his strength to the test with various strongman tricks, got into trouble over time with SMW heavyweight champion Dirty White Boy. After initially defeating White Boy in a non-title match and attacking him, the following week during a match with Killer Kyle, Bedlam then asked for a tag team match with Kyle against White Boy and Tracy Smothers. He pinned White Boy after interference by Jim Cornette who used his tennis racket against White Boy. White Boy wanted revenge and threatened to beat Cornette with his belt for the interference. 
Cornette and Bedlam, however, came and ambushed White Boy again. But it was Cornette who beat the champion with his racket and ran for his life when White Boy then came to. White Boy then defended his title at the Big Apple Brawl for the first time against Bedlam and retained the title after Bedlam was disqualified. That same evening, they also faced each other in a Rage in a Cage eight man tag team match that White Boy's team won. The same week, SNW faced another confrontation after Cornette provoked White Boy with insults against him and his wife Kimberly. That followed by a fight between White Boy and Bedlam in which Bedlam knocked his adversary out accidentally. In the next match between White Boy and Bedlam, a belt was then incorporated in a strap match that White Boy won by disqualification. The culmination of the feud was Ron Wright's comeback to the ring at the Thanksgiving Thunder event series to challenge Cornette and Bedlam with White Boy and his partner. White Boy and Wright won all the duels which ended this feud. The Thrill Seekers was Chris Jericho and Lance Storm, and for many fans was a dream couple. The Thrill Seekers made their debut with SMW in February 1994, and their first match hinted that the two young men had been particularly impressed by the female fans. Storm and Jericho quickly won the hearts of all the fans, but one heart they could not win, SMW mastermind Jim Cornette. While the Thrill Seekers were given a cake by the group of fans during an SMW TV taping in July, Cornette interrupted and told Storm and Jericho that the two made him sick by appealing to the audience. The Seekers listened for a while, then looked at the cake and Cornette got it in the face. A humiliation for which Cornette was to take bitter revenge on the same evening. An amateur filmmaker outside the arena began watching Cornette hurl two masked men at Jericho and Storm outside the arena beating them in the parking lot and dropping Storm crash head first into a car trunk. The Seekers quickly guessed who was behind the mask, Tom Pritchard and Jimmy Del Rey, the Heavenly Bodies. The Heavenly Bodies had lost a loser leave town match a few months earlier against the Rock and Roll Express and had to stay away. The Thrill Seekers sat down after the attack, but a successful ban was lifted for one night and they were allowed to compete against the Heavenly Bodies at the Night of Legends. It was a match that did not go well for the Thrill Seekers because Jericho broke his arm the day of the fight before the match. Nonetheless, he started with a sling. The injury had bad consequences because a combination of blood thinning effects because of the drugs he took, the match became a battleground. Witnesses to the match described Jericho's blood loss similar to the massacre of Bill Alfonso in the ECW or even the mass transit incident. In short, it was not a sight for the faint-hearted. Nonetheless, Jericho fought his way to the bloody mishap, taking his team to a more dramatic looking victory by eventually pinning Del Rey. The day after, Fire on a Mountain was supposed to have a rematch, Jericho was wisely left out. Storm teamed up with Tracy Smothers to defeat the bodies once again. The fight at the Night of Legends was to be the last match of Jericho at SMW. Smoky Mountain held a variety of professional wrestling tournaments between 1992 and 1995 that were competed for by wrestlers that were part of the roster. The SMW Tag Team Championship Tournament was a tournament to crown the first ever SMW Tag Team Champions. It was held between March 12th and April 23rd, 1992, with the finals occurring at Volunteer Slam. The SMW Heavyweight Championship Tournament was also a tournament to crown the first ever SMW Heavyweight Champion. It was held between April 9th and May 22nd, 1992, with the finals also occurring at Volunteer Slam. The King of Kentucky was a one-night single elimination tournament held in Hazard, Kentucky on June 24th, 1993. The NWA World Heavyweight Championship Tournament was a one-night single elimination tournament held in Cherry Hill, New Jersey on November 19, 1994 to decide a new NWA World Heavyweight Champion. The previous champion, Shane Douglas, had infamously threw down the NWA title in favor of the ECW World Heavyweight Championship after defeating Two Cold Scorpio at the NWA World Title Tournament three months earlier. The Carolina Cup Tag Team Tournament was a one-night single elimination tournament held at the Grady Cole Center on August 13, 1995. After SMW closed, Brad Armstrong declared himself SMW Champion and defended the SMW Heavyweight Championship in the United States Wrestling Association. He eventually lost the belt to Jerry the King Lawler on December 30, 1995. 
Though the promotion was highly thought of, it struggled to get a profitable television deal and operated through a wrestling recession that would not end until 1997. After years of operating in red ink, Jim Cornette shut the promotion down in December 1995 to work full-time with the WWF. The last SNW show was held on November 26, 1995 in Cookville, Tennessee and featured the entire SMW roster attacking Jim Cornette who was then pinned by referee Mark Curtis. Several SMW wrestlers would soon obtain work in the WWF including Tracy Smothers, the Dirty White Boy, and Boo Bradley. The SMW video library is now owned by WWE. Both Curtis Comes Home and the 2005 sequel show, held in memory of SMW head referee Mark Curtis, are both considered unofficial reunion shows. That was the untold story of Smoky Mountain Wrestling.